crazy things. And here's she visiting somebody's home. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, T.S. Pitt isn't the only local campus with a haunted history. When the ghosts of Pittsburgh returns, they call it a haunted mansion. Well, up next, hear what a psychic has to say about Old Byers Hall. You're looking for a nice place to haunt. You just can't beat a good old Victorian mansion. Unfortunately, over the years, many turn-of-the-century mansions around Pittsburgh fell victim to termites or the wrecking ball. But in the 1960s, some folks over at Allegheny County Community College stepped in to save one. And they've gotten a whole lot more than they bargained for. Esther Tro has the story of the ghost of Byers Hall. Imagine you're a Pittsburgh police officer responding to a burglary call at a local campus. You and two other officers walk into the dark building with your flashlights on. When you hit the second floor, suddenly all three flashlights go off. That's just one of the many bizarre things that have happened here at Byers Hall over the years. A college building that was once a mansion for the very rich. A lot of unexplained things have a way of happening here at Byers Hall. The ornate 90... of security guards wa walking late at night in the building and feeling someone pushing them on, on the back and turning around and no one being there. At the turn of the century, Byers Hall was an elaborate single-family home on Ridge Avenue, a street dubbed Millionaire's Row. The North Side Street had the greatest concentration of millionaires living anywhere in Pittsburgh. It was here that iron industry magnate Alexander Byers lived with his wife and five children. It is here that tragedy struck. One of the servants, a female servant, was uh, her duty was to watch one of the Byers' children. But according to one story, the maid, Marianne, neglected her duty. The building had dumb waiters in it that went from the first, third floor down to the first floor. Supposedly, the child climbed in an empty dumbwaiter shaft and fell to her death, the little child. The maid that was entrusted with her care was so distraught, so goes the story, that she hung herself in the same dumbwaiter. So the ghost of Byers are the ghost of the little child and then the ghost of the uh, maid that was entrusted to watch this child. When the college bought the mansion in the late 60s, the rumors of eerie, unexplainable events started to fly. Most emanated from the third floor where the servants used to live and where campus organizations like the student newspaper set up shop. In the late 1980s, reporters hated Friday night deadlines more than usual because the events they claimed were highly unusual. Some of the bizarre events took place around bathrooms. Even though the bathtub was still there, the, the faucets and everything were gone and it was just capped. So it was incapable of producing running water, but students heard running water. I feel like electricity charge went through my hands. What I pick up when I do this is I pick up what they call magnetic impressions. Magnetic impressions are impressions that are left behind. And when I go someplace and I start feeling magnetic impressions, and I walk into a place that definitely has spirit activity, my hands will start to tingle. Saw a little girl looking out the window, looks like she's crying. Are we ready? Reputed Pittsburgh psychic Charles Kiefer toured Byers Hall this October night for the first time without knowing its haunted history. Picking up somebody by the name of George and Mary Ann. The woman that's 
in this place does not want us here. She's telling us very politely to leave. Upstairs. We're going to go upstairs. Next stop, the third floor where the servants once lived. Servants who used back stairways and catered extensively to Pittsburgh's elite. This is where the person feels mostly at home, is upstairs here. For some reason, they feel more comfortable up here than they do any place else in the building. It's getting hard to breathe, though. So whoever was here before must have died of something that had to do with breathing. I get the impression she enjoys being able to go around where she wants to. Nobody bothers her. So she can walk in and out of a room. Nobody pays attention to her. But she's totally at peace. She's happy. This is her place. She's content. I don't ever see her leaving here. Administrators who spend their days in Byers Hall say despite all the talk of ghosts and spirits, since the college took over and renovated the building, nothing bad has happened here. There's never been anything malicious or, e or even evil that we know of that's ever happened in this building. It's more of a prank nature, and the spirit seems to have a good sense of humor. We're proud of our building, and we're proud of our guests. I'm very comfortable here. I, I can pull up a couch or a bed and sleep on it right now. It wouldn't bother me. But then they never did bother me. So... <laughs> It's a lovely, charming Victorian building that now serves a useful life in a uh, community college. Despite all the haunting stories about Byers Hall, a lot of college administrators say they still enjoy working here because of the building's incredible beauty. But a few security guards told us privately they'd prefer to pass. Thanks, Esther. I get the impression, yes, I definitely sense a break coming up. Up next, a trip to Troy Hill, where you may just find a ghostly little group of Pittsburgh firefighters. Where you may just find a ghostly little group of Pittsburgh firefighters. When the alarm goes off, when they're needed most, Pittsburgh firefighters have been known to do a super job. But would you believe that some of the city's finest are not only super, they're supernatural? David Johnson takes us on a trip to Troy Hill and the heroin haunted firehouse. The community of Troy Hill overlooks the city of Pittsburgh just over the shoulder of the Heinz plant on Route 28. Tucked away in the center of Troy Hill is Engine Company 39, one of the city of Pittsburgh's finest and most colorful fire departments with more than just a spark. of the supernatural. Night after night, for almost a century, the Troy Hill Firehouse has maintained a silent vigil while the city below has slept. Scores of firefighters have served from this lofty perch. And for decades, it's been rumored that while some of those firefighters passed away years ago, they're keeping their own form of active duty at the firehouse. Back in October of 1966, when I first came on, we were sitting in a kitchen in the evening, and the door slammed shut. And the, uh, I asked the camera, I says, is that door broke or what? He says, no, no, he says, that's all Lieutenant Hughes. Uh, it's the way he comes in and out. And I says, well, who's Lieutenant Hughes? He says, the guy died across the street. He says, he just died last week. It's not unknown for the, the, uh, the bed to be shaken while uh, you're sleeping in it or uh, the blank to be pulled off you. Door slamming, people getting up and walking around. There's nobody even there to get up and walk around. Uh, I've been here, this is my 17th total year, and uh, I've never experienced anything myself, although you know, after 17 years you start collecting old stories. But as recently as like the last month, uh, uh, finally someone grabbed my leg while I was sleeping, and uh, you could make an argument that I was asleep and I imagined something, but the second time they grabbed my leg, I was wide awake and they shook it. They just picked it up and shook it. And it, it's, I'm not the first and I'm sure I won't be the last. As one might expect, the mysterious activities are more abundant at night. Many a firefighter has been rudely awakened by the fire pole hole cover that slams mysteriously closed, seemingly of its own accord.
right at the bottom of my bed, there is a door that uh, goes up to the hose tower. And um, this door frequently blows open due to the fact that the wind blows on the roof, comes down the, the staircase, and will blow this door open. So there's a slide bolt. And um, the one night I know the door was locked because I myself used to check it before I'd go to bed. So um, I was sound asleep. And the bolt slid open, the door flew open and banged against the back wall. I, I figured, wait a minute, I locked that. So I got up out of bed, I closed the door again, I went back to bed, and I, you know, I, like I mentioned before, I heard the door open, the bolt open, the door slammed against the wall, and uh, then I heard the footsteps coming down the, the stairs. Someone walking across the floor and then going into one of the metal lockers and they lift the handle of the metal locker and opened it up, and then they slammed it closed, and it really made a, a loud noise. And I threw the blankets off of my head to see who was in the room, and looked around the room. There was no one in the room. I believe that there's spirits walking around this engine house, and they are letting their presence be known. At night, there's always a night watchman on duty. No matter what city firehouse you might be near, there's a night watchman on duty. One night, as the night watchman was uh, doing his uh, lonely vigil, he was about his rounds, and he came down the basement stairs. And as he uh, went towards the restroom over there, he uh, looked to the left, and the right where I'm standing, he seen a uh, card game complete with uh, four, four chairs, four players, one table. Now this particular area, the basement is uh, used, uh, as you can see, uh, workout areas. It's used as a gym. There's no card playing here. Yeah. Uh, there hasn't been card playing here since 1927. On more than one occasion, psychics have been brought in to peruse the firehouse. The psychics said that indeed we had at least uh, 12 extra guests at every party, and uh, you know, three of them were uh, clergymen. One was a dog, and uh, eight other were uh, firefighters that decided to stay on. And this psychic said, I see a dog in the corner. And I thought to myself, well, I wonder what dog she sees. So she started describing a dog, a small dog that was jumping around on the bed. And here, as I'm standing there, and I'm the only one that knows deep down what she's talking about, she was talking about my dog that I had when I was a small child. And uh, she says the dog was jumping around, and I still thought, Nah, it was just a good guess. And then all of a sudden she mentioned the dog's name, and my dog's name was Queenie. And she reiterated that to me, that that was the, the, the dog's name who was jumping on the bed, who was protecting the firefighter who sleeps in the bed, because she didn't know it was me. Then it sort of makes the, the hair stand up on your arms, you know? They're very... Uh easy to get along with fellas. They're not malevolent, they're benevolent spirits. They like this place. Of course, the city closed and I don't know where it'll go. <laughs> Back in 1989, the Troy Hill Firehouse was closed for renovation and only two people had a key to the building, Chief Dorsey and the contractor. Well, late one night, Chief Dorsey came by long after the workmen had left to check on the progress he found paint cans strewn all over the place. Now, he stepped out for a bit, and when he came back, those paint cans were stacked in a perfect pyramid. Seems a ghost take as much pride in the firehouse as the firefighters. Thanks, David. From firehouse phantoms to little flower shop ghosts, our next stop is Edna to pay a visit to a paranormal prankster named Peter when the ghosts of Pittsburgh return of ghosts as they were portrayed in the movies as old chain rattling apparitions who glide around and don't talk but some of pittsburgh's purported ghosts well they're a little different it seems we have young ghosts middle-aged ghosts and even spunky little specters no more than seven or eight years old daria chisholm is in etna where the locals say a rascally little ghost named peter routinely raises havoc in a local flower shop this building in Etna has been standing here on Bridge Street for close to 100 years. 
It was once a hotel, then later a tavern and a restaurant. At one point, some townspeople say it was even a bordello. Today, the building is divided into several apartments, and there's a flower shop in front. It is here that strange and mysterious things seem to happen. Things that nobody knows how to explain. He's there, you know. I don't know what it is, but something's there in that building. He went downstairs into the basement, and that's where I saw him. You know, whenever something happened, you just knew it was Peter. Everybody just said, oh, Peter's back. when David Cornelli bought the Michael Blaha flower shop and moved it into this building, his new landlord pulled no punches. He warned Cornelli the turn-of-the-century structure was haunted. So I just thought, eh, story of Etna, you know, didn't think anything of it. Peter left me wait for a couple of weeks before he started his <laughs> fooling around. The first incident that happened was about a week uh, prior to me opening up the shop down here. I had put a sign in the window saying, Michael Blaha Flowers, new location. It was securely up on the window. Left, came back the next morning. The sign was all crooked and wrinkled and scotch taped up like a little kid would do. It was a mess, but I left it that way. <laughs> I mean, that was the start of Peter, for me anyway. The floral shop owner says the little ghost graduated to tinkering with electronics. First, unexplained activities at the cash register. Then, bizarre bouts with a normally reliable telephone answering machine that suddenly refused to work. The phone company could not figure out why they could not get this thing to work. And they just finally gave up on it. And then it came on all by itself. It was even turned off. He would roam the building. He just wouldn't stay here in the flower shop. He would go into the basement. He would go into the apartments. In the basement, Peter reportedly reveled in pulling pranks and occasionally pulling the hair of unsuspecting workers. I was upstairs when I heard this terrible scream. And I come running down the steps, I said, what happened, Kathy? She says, somebody pulled my hair. Well, there was nobody here except her and I, so it had to be Peter. She didn't stay with me too much longer after that. <laughs> Beyond the basement, tenants who once lived in the adjacent apartments tell stories of bizarre events they still can't explain. Just the mattress. You know, it just shakes. I was always sound asleep. Um, and all of a sudden, I would just be aware that this mattress was shaking. You know, there was a motion like this that you couldn't ignore. I mean, it was there and it was happening. WQED Executive Secretary Stephanie Madiak lived in the third floor apartment for two years. And, um, it's just the most bizarre feeling. You know, when you sit there and you know you're awake, you know you aren't dreaming. And this, this would happen. At first, Stephanie thought it might be a train. But she saw and heard nothing on the tracks. No trains running and no trucks rumbling by. It also went through my mind, okay, I'm dreaming this the first couple times it happened. And, but I made a conscious effort, got myself up, and the bed is still shaking, and I realized, well, Obviously, I'm not dreaming this. It wasn't the train. It wasn't the trucks. What else could it be? Who knows? I, I don't. Dee Miller is a reputed Pittsburgh psychic. David Cornelli called her to come to the flower shop and take a look and a walk around. He was cute. I saw the spirit. He had on a... He was dressed in what might be termed maybe Dutch or German. Had a little hat on. And I said, uh, he said he burned in the fire. We found a lady that knew the history, and she said that it was a bordello at one time. 
and this little boy must have been an illegitimate child that was playing with matches up in this room. Oddly enough, I never really felt frightened by all of this. So I think, you know, perhaps he kind of liked having me there. Maybe he needed a mother, you know. I don't know. It was really strange. We've covered the area for 118 years, but uh, as far as I know, this is the only ghost story that we've carried. The area's community newspaper, The Herald, has reported for years on the strange stories emanating from this Etna building. When I came into the store, I didn't expect, as I said, uh, all kinds of weird things to be happening or to hear strange noises or for uh, people to come from behind counters and say, I'm the monster man and stuff like that. No. It was a very enjoyable story. I enjoyed doing it. Never believed in it before, but I do now. I think really he should probably be able to be resting in peace. But he seems to be happy, so, you know, all we can do is keep him happy. <laughs> in the late 1970s and early 80s, two sisters from Sharpsburg had a gift, an antique shop here where the flower shop now stands. They told the Herald newspaper that strange things happened to them too. Dolls were tossed around and toys were moved and the doors seemed to open and close all by themselves. Order flowers from shop in Aetna by phone. Thanks, Daria. When the ghosts of Pittsburgh returns, we take a tour of the Mon River in search of a ghost in a watery gray. Not all of Pittsburgh's ghost stories involve people. In fact, one of the most haunting mysteries involves a military plane. Tonight, Bob Bruce takes a haunting boat ride back to the Mon River to pick up the mysterious missing pieces of the Ghost Bomber. Since the beginning of aviation, a total of 10 airplanes have crashed here in the murky waters of the Mon. All have been recovered, except for one, a B-25 Billy Mitchell bomber that crashed here in 1956. Hundreds of Pittsburghers actually saw it. Thousands more read about it. The B-25 crash that killed two crew members and injured four others. Retired newspaper reporter George Swetnam was at the scene in 1956. Nobody had any doubt that it would be found down there. It was just assumed it would be. But the days turned into weeks. The Army Corps of Engineers swept mile after mile using extra equipment and manpower to search the bottom of the river. Their efforts yielded nothing but frustration. Now how in the world could a plane that size get lost in a river that was only 15 feet deep? When Channel 11 reporter Jack Edsel investigated new leads in 1978, he found the Air Force still insisting that the plane was in the river and the Army Corps of Engineers suggesting someone, somehow, had secretly hauled it away. Well, my honest opinion is I don't think it is. I think the plane was removed for the how, when, or where, I don't know. A bomber disappeared in this river. <laughs> how? How? <laughs> how can that happen? I believe it's the biggest mystery since the, uh, uh, the JFK assassination, since, since Amelia Earhart. It's on that level. You have something disappearing off the face of the earth. And in this river, it's our, it's our mystery. It's our ghost. Pittsburgh filmmaker Ray Duquesne has spent hours on the banks of the Mon and two years researching the ghost bomber's disappearance. He believes the U.S. government secretly removed the plane and hauled it away, either by truck, by rail, or by concealing dismantled pieces of the wreckage on a barge. Why would the government want to spirit the bomber away? Well, over the years, some researchers have maintained there was an extra 3,000 pounds of cargo on board. Cargo the government 
did not want the public to know about. But they went to great lengths to make, uh, make sure the people of Pittsburgh didn't know that that 3,000 pounds was in the river. The plane took off from Nellis Air Force Base, just outside of Las Vegas. Area 51 is a classified base. They did atomic testing. Uh, the stealth bomber, the U-2 bomber, these were all covert things that were developed there at Area 51. So this wasn't an ordinary plane from an ordinary base on an ordinary mission. There was also a seventh man. There were six men on the flight manifest. However, the rescues that took place on the river, there was a seventh man pulled out. He's never been identified, and I felt that he was babysitting the cargo. And to get his, his uh, name out would also compromise whatever was on board. Whatever was aboard the plane could have been dangerous enough to be kept a secret, and dangerous enough to cause a citywide panic upon crash. There was no panic, but to this day, there are still no answers, no hard evidence of what really happened back in 1956. Those things don't happen very mysteriously here. Not big things as big as a plane. It came from a mysterious location and ended up in a mysterious circumstance. From beginning to end, the whole thing takes on a whole supernatural tint. Many groups have tried to use sonar to locate the ghost bomber, but they have found no trace. Even now, 40 years after the crash, the whole story of what really happened to that B-25 refuses to surface. Thanks, Bob. You know, a lot of witnesses who saw the B-25 go down were steel workers at the Homestead Works. And over the years, the men of steel encountered a few good ghosts of their own. When we return, the one and only Chili Billy Cardilli takes us in search of some steel mill spirits. If it's caught on tape, it's on real TV. Michael Stunt is supposed to. Ghost stories migrated out of the mills, the steel mills that sprawled for miles across this city's landscape. Bill Cardell takes us from the south side to Braddock in search of steel mill ghosts. Certainly, a big part of our history is the steel industry. But the steel industry is itself a ghost of what it once was in Pittsburgh. A mill here, a coke plant there, dot a valley that was once teeming with the life of the steel industry. But inasmuch as molten steel was its lifeblood, that red-hot metal brought a violent death to some of the workers who kept that industry alive. Men and women who would become ghosts of steel. The steel mills are rich in stories about ghosts. There's lots of legends associated with them. One steel mill worker told me, and she wouldn't give me her name, but she told me that a good friend of hers who worked down in the tunnels beneath the steel mill ran into an apparition that was visible from the waist up and from the waist down. He was just a green haze. Now, the story goes that a number of years ago, the man was down in the tunnels where they send the trolley cars down, and he was on the tracks and couldn't get out of the way and was severed at the waist and killed. Now she says her friend saw this apparition, which we can only assume is the same man. Another incident down in the, the tunnels beneath the mills is Flag Kyle Annie. Back in the early 1950s, a Pitt student, University of Pittsburgh, was working down there and he saw a young girl down there. She was dressed in plain clothes, and looked a little lost, and he said, you better get out of here, you're likely to get killed down here. And she said, well, I, I can't be killed, I'm already dead. And he was a little unnerved and ran back to his boss and told the story to his boss, and his boss said, well, my word, that sounds exactly like Slagpile Annie, a woman who worked the same trolley train that you did down in the tunnels, who died five years before you worked here. The great steel mills that once towered over Pittsburgh's south side are but a memory. Gone are the mills where men and women literally gave their lives for their jobs. Places like J&L's infamous two shop. In two shops, there were more than 40 people killed there over the years. And what happened is lots of times men would fall into a hot ladle of steel. And when they fell in, they were instantly incinerated. When this happened, the steel was considered polluted. And the, in the early years of the steel mill, they would dump 
the, uh, the hot steel off into a slag heap. Now, later on, when they started breaking up this slag heap, some people said it released the spirits of the steel mill workers and cries and moans and wails could be heard throughout the steel mill. One of the men who died in two shop was Jim Grabowski. As the story goes, in 1922, Grabowski tripped over a hose and fell to his death in the ladle below. Though his death was mercifully quick, workers claimed to hear his screams echoing through the mill for decades to come until it was finally torn down. All the steel mills seem to have a ghost story. Uh, the Edgar Thompson Works in Braddock has its story in boiler number 16. Men have seen a thick white mist or a cluster of steam floating through the, the mill. Now, some people say it's the ghost of Joe Majorac. Other people say it's a man who uh, jumped into a, a hot vat of steel because he was upset and committed suicide. And his ghost still wanders around the mill. As you can see, the tales of these ghosts of steel are as varied as the thousands of workers who brought the mills to life. Back to you, John. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Bill. After, After a hard, hard day's work, work, how about some fine spirits? When we return, a trip to the haunted Harmony Inn. Cemetery, when they can be the talk of the local tavern. Our Dennis Bowman went to Harmony, Butler County in search of a few good spirits at the inn. Welcome to the Harmony Inn, a quaint, cozy restaurant and bar that's quite popular with its patrons. The folks who work here say it's also quite popular with at least one ghost. Now, most people call him Louie, and they claim that he's a, a bit of a prankster who wants everybody to know that he's still around. But so far tonight, Louie hasn't pulled anything unusual, but the folks here say that Louie is a spirited old spirit who shows up here at the Harmony Inn when you least expect it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. When you dine at the Harmony Inn and someone shows up to greet you, just remember, it may not be your waiter. The worst thing would be people would be afraid when they felt taps. Diners would feel taps on their backs when they're upstairs dining. The weird welcome some patrons describe is still pretty warm compared to the chilly reception co-owner Carl Beers got in 1985. It was uh, unusually warm for April, probably 80, 82 degrees, and that's what stuck in my mind. So I opened up the front door, and immediately, as soon as I opened it, this huge gust of wind started to blow down the steps, probably 40 degrees temperature-wise, and it kept blowing. It was enough to move your hair, blow your hair. And I said, my golly, this isn't, uh, isn't normal. I didn't feel scared, but it was almost like the, the being letting me know, I'm here, and I want you to know that I will be here. And depending on what story you hear, the Harmony Inn ghost has apparently been here for a long, long time. At the turn of the century, the inn was a saloon. Later, it became a hotel, then a bar and restaurant. And during Prohibition, it was a speakeasy. One of the former owners was actually named Louie hence the nickname for the ghost. This place makes you believe because so many weird things happen. So many things that happen now that you don't even think about because you don't even notice it. But other people just are just stunned uh, by what goes on. And you say, oh, 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 that's, that's the harm in. That's Louie. There are other stories, too. Some think the ghost is a man who fell over this stairway. Some believe it's actually a woman killed in a crash involving a horse and buggy and a car in the early 1900s. Somebody was badly injured and then carried in here, and then eventually they died later that day. And some people say that that's the, the spirit. 
No matter what you believe, the people who work here say you better believe this is one spooky place to work. They claim TVs go on and off on their own, lights routinely flicker, and coffee pots have been known to simply sail through the air. And it flipped off the top of this ice machine and landed right in the middle of where I was walking. I mean, it didn't rock back and forth or nothing. It just sat straight up, didn't bust. And I just stepped over and I'm like, okay, Louise, <laughs> whoever you are, just leave me alone. <laughs> but like many of the patrons here, the purported ghost appears to have quite a fun-loving nature. He's generous, too. He may not throw pennies from heaven, but cooks and managers say he has dropped dimes and once even quarters during a double rainbow. It just kept getting brighter and brighter, and then it got to be a double, and, and Bob said, oh, we should follow that to the end so we can get the pot of gold. And as soon as he said that, this old quarter just plinked down onto the ground out of nowhere. Uh, he just kind of likes to wander around, see what, you know, what's going on, and where he can have the most fun, and then he... He has it. He enjoys himself. And around the Harmony Inn, no one seems to mind. We don't want this ghost to die or to move. We're, he's almost one of our family now, and uh, we like him. Ironically, the owners of the Harmony Inn, Carl and Gary, bought the place on April Fool's Day in 1985. They knew the inn had a haunted past, but it wasn't until they actually moved in that they really started to experience the strange events firsthand. Oh, may I have another uh, Perrier, please? Please. <laughs> no more dining with Dennis. Thanks for joining me tonight. You still may not believe in ghosts, but you have to admit, there are some things we just can't explain. No kidding, pal. What do you think I've been trying to tell you for the last hour? <laughs>